Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Zoom-based webinar. My name is Professor Ann Kargosian, and it is my pleasure as the director of the Promise Armenian Institute at UCLA to welcome you to our second webinar of 2023, this one coordinated by our Armenian Studies Center within the Promise Armenian Institute. This lecture will be presented by Dr. Artyom Tanoyan of Hamline University, who is the editor of a recently published volume with the same title as his presentation today, Black Garden of Flame, the Nagorno-Karabakh Conflict in the Soviet and Russian Press, a subject with obvious relevance to the situation today in this very troubled region. We are delighted to welcome Dr. Tonoyan to our virtual stage and also to welcome Professor Sebu Aslanian of the UCLA History Department, who is director of our Armenian Studies Center as the coordinator of this event. For today's webinar, I'm grateful to note the co-sponsorship by the UCLA Richard Hovhannisian Endowed Chair in Modern Armenian History, the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, or Nasser, and the Ararat Eskijin Museum. On behalf of the co-sponsors here at UCLA, I would like to acknowledge our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the indigenous Gabrielino Tongva peoples. And especially at this moment and in conjunction with this event, I would like to express on behalf of our UCLA Promise Armenian Institute family, our continued horror and outrage at the humanitarian crisis that was triggered on December 12, 2022, by the blockage of the Seoul Mountain Road link linking Artsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh to Armenia, by Azerbaijani activists. This blockade of the transport of essential food, medicine, and supplies is inflicting collective harm on 120,000 innocent civilians, and we call on the international community to organize a humanitarian intervention immediately before it is too late and to pressure Azerbaijan to end this illegal blockade. And now back to our webinar, my colleague and friend, Professor Sebo Aslanian will provide a formal introduction for our speaker in a moment. But let me note that for those of you watching live via the Zoom webinar platform, you have an opportunity to send questions to us by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom portion of your screen and typing in the question. Please be sure to be as specific and succinct as possible in your questions, and we will direct as many of the questions as are practical to our speaker when he is finished. We anticipate that the webinar itself will take around 40 minutes, after which we will begin the Q&A portion of the event. Also, please note that this event is being recorded for future viewing at our Promise Armenian Institute website and YouTube channel. And in the unlikely event that this Zoom webinar drops for any reason, please just connect right back to the same link as it will put you back into our Zoom session. And now it gives me great pleasure to turn the webinar over to its coordinator, Professor Sebu Aslanian of UCLA's Department of History. Professor Aslanian is the director of the Armenian Studies Center within the PAI and has been the holder of the Richard Hovhannisian Endowed Chair in Modern Armenian History since 2012. Professor Aslanian is the author of the widely acclaimed book, from the Indian Ocean to the Mediterranean, the global trade networks of Armenian merchants from New Julfa, and has recently completed his second book, Early Modernity and Mobility, Port Cities and Printers Across the Armenian Diaspora, 1512 to 1800, which will appear soon through Yale University Press. So Sebu, I'll now turn the webinar over to you for an introduction of our speaker. Thank you very much, Anne, for that wonderful introduction. And uh, welcome, everybody. I joined Dr. Anne Karagosian in welcoming you to this timely event hosted by our institute. I will provide first a brief introduction uh, for our lecturer, Dr. Artyom Tonoyan. We are truly honored and thankful for Artyom, uh, to Artyom for agreeing to join us today and making this event possible. After my introduction, Dr. Tonoyan will deliver his talk 
for roughly 45 minutes, following which we will have a Q&A period with the audience. I ask you, the, uh, the audience members, to write down your questions as succinctly as possible and to commun communicate them to us via the chat option at the bottom of your screens. We will field as many of your questions as time will permit. So a native of Gyumri, Armenia, Dr. Artyom Tonoyan is a sociologist and visiting professor of global studies at Hamline University in St. Paul, Minnesota. His research interests include the sociology of religion, religion and politics in the South Caucasus, and religion and nationalism in post-Soviet Russia, issues that are very timely for all of us today. Antyom defended his dissertation under the gui guidance of the celebrated sociologist, the late Peter N. Berger. His articles have appeared in Demokratiza Demokratizativa, the Journal of Post-Soviet Democratization, Society, and Modern Greek Studies Yearbook, among others. He has been a frequent guest on the BBC, Deutsche Welle, Franz 24, and other outlets. He is the editor of the recently published volume, Black Garden of Flame, the Nagorno-Karabakh Conflict in the Soviet and Russian Press. So without further ado, I welcome my friend Artyom to the, I uh, pass the baton to him and we will field questions after his talk. Thank you very much, Artyom, for joining us and thank you all as well. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Sebu, for the kind introduction and thank you, Anne. Uh, for your introduction as well. And I would like to thank all the sponsors and, and the UCLA Promise Armenian Institute for initiating this uh, talk. Um, and I'm really honored uh, to be uh, speaking to my colleagues at UCLA and also to the broader, broader constituents and to the viewers and the listeners who have joined the webinar. It is truly an honor and uh, the timing could not could not be more perfect given everything that's happening in the region. And I think um, the book and what I am about to say uh, um, bear strong witness to the importance uh, of of what is happening. Um, so uh, I plan to uh, to talk about this in, in uh, I'll just say how I'm going to do about it. Uh, my, uh, <clears throat> I would like to read a page from the introduction that I wrote uh, to the book. Uh, I am a better explainer when I put pen to paper than when I speak. So my thoughts as they had gathered, I, I wrote them down and I would like to read from there. And then I will give you sort of an archaeology of how the book came about and some of the topics that uh, emerge that I noticed emerging uh, from the collection of these articles that I put together. Um, so why this book? Uh, the South Caucasus is not the center of the attention of Western media, to say the least. The occasional coverage of the region falls largely into two categories. Tourism, more often than not, commissioned advertorials by local ministries of tourism, or war, as in the case of South Caucasus, or South Ossetia and Georgia in 2008. When it comes to the South Caucasus, journalism largely consists in saying Lord Jones is dead to people who never knew Lord Jones was alive, in the words of inimitable G.K. Chesterton. People usually do not know or perhaps do not care about the region until and unless something of note takes place. In general, it's something of a blessing to the Western audiences when Russia is involved, in which case a ready-made geopolitical framing of the, issues of, of the issues of concern can be pulled out of the drawer and given a new shine. Such a verdict may sound overly dolorous or unduly cynical, with apologies to those tireless journalists who risk life and limb to cover the region in times of profound crisis for little personal gain but it may not be that far from the truth. This is another way of saying that Western journalistic interests probably match the general or even the precise contours of Western geopolitical interests in the region. Be that as it may, the Russian media's footprint in the region has been far larger and far deeper 
if not more storied. The point made here does not mean that it was better, but it was more, infinitely more. As such, the output of Soviet and Russian journalists on the happenings in the region in general and on the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict in particular is a veritable mountain next to a veritable molehill. We can only hope that the book the reader is holding will prove to be a worthy Sherpa as the reader tries to climb that mountain. As we wrote above, Russian knowledge of the region is as vast as it is intimate. It is with this intimate familiarity in mind that we have made available to specialists and general readers alike this carefully selected, translated, and edited collection of articles that have appeared in the Soviet and post-Soviet Russian media since the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict first began in 1980s. The goal of the book is to provide both the broadest and the deepest context of Russian understanding of the conflict as it has been dissected, litigated, and relitigated on the pages of the Soviet and Russian press. To be sure, there is no such thing as the Russian view of the Armenian-Azerbaijani conflict. There are, and always have been, multiple views on how to settle it, depending on the political and increasingly geopolitical winds blowing in the region. Moscow has at times favored Yerevan, and at other times Baku, but in all circumstances, it has favored Moscow, to no one's surprise. So when presenting such a collection, the immediate question that needs answering is, what is so special about the Soviet and Russian press coverage of the conflict? <clears throat> the importance of the Soviet and Russian press coverage can be summed up in the words of Bernard Cecil Cohen, when he wrote way back in 1964 about a different war about in a different uh, time zone and a geographical area, that, quote, the press is significantly more than a purveyor of information and opinion. It may not be successful much of the time in telling people what to think, but it is stunningly successful in telling its readers what to think about. With this in mind, it is my purpose to introduce to readers the most comprehensive press coverage of the conflict, apart from the press in, of the conflict is co countries, hoping that the readers will learn and study the entire range of issues that Soviet and Russian commentators, analysts, and politicians considered worth examining and commenting upon. In short, what people should both think and think about. More than anything else, I envision the book to be a ready-made tool for historical, political, and social analysis for scholars and historians specializing in the late Soviet period and the South Caucasus, as well as students of nationalism and political conflicts. Then I give the structure of the book. It has four uh, uh, sections that cover various, so under uh, several thematic uh, uh, thematic umbrellas or canopies. So that is sort of why the book is important. And uh, the, the, there is also a story to be told how the book came about and as uh, uh, because it also has aspects of biography and how the book came about. It was at the height of the war in 2020. Uh, I was having some conversations and I was getting late night phone calls from the press to comment on the conflict and so on and so forth. And I saw some uh, terrible reporting in the Western media, especially in the New York Times, who in the beginning had chosen completely to ignore the conflict. And then when it started writing, uh, publishing articles about the conflict, it was completely uh, uh, almost uh, propagandistic. Uh, uh, pushing the Azerbaijani government storyline and the narrative on how the conflict came about and how it should be solved and so on and so forth. So at the height of this, uh, the conflict in 2020, I was having conversations with the owner of the Eastview Press, Mr. Kent Lee, and Eastview has uh, enormous repositories and uh, of of collection of Soviet era newspapers and so on and so forth and. We decided that maybe I should sit down uh, and read these articles and come up with a compendium and a reader that would provide uh, Western 
scholars and policymakers and so on and so forth, a view of the conflict that is sort of not appreciated enough, given the size of Russia and the size of Russia's imperial ambitions in the post-Soviet world and the size of uh, Russian geopolitical interests. Uh, so that was sort of how the book came about. And it, I also was motivated uh, partly by the fact that there is great illiteracy on, on the conflict uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh. And one of the reasons that there is so much illiteracy is that there are no, uh, not there are not a whole lot of students interested in, 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 in the region, uh, particularly because of linguistic difficulties. Not many people in the US uh, that are interested in the region, at least remotely, either speak the language or have been to the region. And it has sort of kept people back from uh, writing or commenting uh, uh, knowledgeably on the region. And I remember when I was an, a graduate student working on my dissertation, there was great difficulty in, in securing funds to travel to the region and working in the archives and digging through the newspapers, trying to find articles that were relevant and so on and so forth. So I thought uh, that... Uh, I would like to deprive the students of the excuse not to study the region by bringing to them a collection of articles that are representative sample uh, that would allow students to dig into these sources and, and start talking and writing about it. Uh, but why uh, did I make the book the way it is? Uh, the book, in a sense, is weird. Uh, it is not a monograph. Uh, I... I am working on a monograph, and it is not uh, your typical edited volume where you have an editor who has gathered together several authors and they tackle a topic, either disparate or similar in, in themes, and then the editor puts this together, sews them together, and presents it as, as a book. What I did... Uh, essentially, I spent months and months in in these uh, Russian and Soviet media uh, newspaper repositories. Uh, I spent about eight or nine months gathering all these articles, uh, read around 3,000 articles or so, over a million words, uh, and uh, sifted through them and put them through a sieve trying to bring together the best of available uh, Russian reporting, either day-to-day -day reporting of the conflict or opinion pieces that were written that more or less objective and, and were not uh, done by pay, paid propagandists and so on and so forth. So why did I choose it to do it this way um, rather than offer an analysis uh, based on these articles? also had to do with my Armenian background. Anytime, uh, as you can imagine, an Armenian comments on the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict or writes an article on the Nagorno-Karabakh uh, conflict, there is always uh, this apprehension that you're going to be sort of uh, attacked as, uh, uh, as, uh, as, as a biased individual and so on and so forth. So our analysis, at least for the uh, other side of the, uh, the conflict, uh, <clears throat> would appear as either uh, biased or propagandistic and insignificant and so on and so forth. It would be easily and readily dismissed. So I chose to go to these sources, uh, put them together, and offer not the Armenian view, not the Azerbaijani view, but the Russian view. Uh, the Russian view of the conflict or many Russian views of the conflict, I think uh, in the final analysis uh, matters just as much as the Armenian and Azerbaijani views of the conflict. Because whether we want it or not, uh, it is for all intents and purposes, uh, an area and a region where Russia has, for the last couple of hundred years, projected power through its cultural export, but also through uh, force of force of its arms and so on and so forth. So, uh, Russia is this giant uh, that anytime it moves one way or another, it is bound to significantly 
alter political, cultural, and geopolitical dynamics. So it made sense to sort of bring about this collection of articles and and presented uh, in a way that uh, scholars, but also specialists and policymakers and anyone that is interested would find useful in trying to understand the Russian logic. Uh, in so far as it exists, and we know it exists, uh, uh, people running the country at the moment may seem to be irrational, but there is certain logic to their actions and to their uh, and 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 the way they go about uh, conducting policy and foreign policy. Now the question is: Was I able to, you know, by not offering analysis, was I able to uh, escape this bias? So of course. Uh, we're all uh, subjects and subjective individuals. And uh, re recently, uh, Sebu introduced me to the works of Carlo Ginzburg, his UCLA colleague. And I read this fantastic book of his, uh, the, uh, the cheese, the worm and the cheese, or, or, or something like that. And there is a fantastic line in, in one of the discussions on gathering the sources and objective sources. And it says, everything is biased, essentially. Even a simple inventory is biased. So I put together as much as I try to escape my biases and so on. And so for somebody, I'm sure will find an element of bias there in, in the way I collected these articles and, and inventorized them in a sense. Um, <clears throat> Another motivation for the book was, uh, you know, when you look, uh, the, 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 when the war started, there was much consternation in the Armenian press and the Armenian expert community and so on and so forth about Russia's response or the lack thereof. And a lot of people uh, uh, were surprised why Russia was acting the way it was acting. And it comes down to essentially this consternation to a lack of education uh, uh, trying to understand Kremlin's motivations, Putin's motivations, uh, the foreign policy establishment's motivations. And a lot of this uh, was taken for granted in the Armenian press and the media. Uh, it was, to me, it was in a sense like uh, the Armenians collectively, at least to me, the, in the expert community or the, or, or the faculties in colleges uh, reminded me of uh, uh, Dostoevsky character from his uh, novel The Demons. Uh, there is an engineer uh, who is revolutionary, Kirillov, who says, uh, uh, I don't have the slightest knowledge of the Russian people and I have absolutely no time to study them. And I wanted to essentially uh, bring this collection together and, and, and in a sense to motivate people to study in at least in, in, uh, among Armenian scholars, uh, what motivates Russian foreign policy establishment and, and not take for granted the, the relations that have existed between our two countries and, and, and so on and so forth. So the other question is, uh, since I have not done the analysis uh, and I've provided this text for other people to do the analysis, to do content analysis and so on and so forth. And there are several themes that were particularly interesting for me that emerge from these articles. There is, I think, around 300, 300 articles that I've put together. And these themes that were interesting for me were not just the local dynamics, how the war started and where it was going and the day-to-day -day developments and so on and so forth, but I was interested to see how the Russian press and how the Russian commentariat uh, envisioned or how they saw uh, the involvement of uh, other actors that were trying to make inroads into the region and, and trying to manage the conflict or trying to change the dynamics of the conflict and so on and so forth. And the three that emerged for me, at least uh, that were interesting for me and the readers will find, uh, uh, readers of the book will find much information and much interesting information in the pages of the book. 
were Turkey's uh, reaction and the evolution of Turkey's position with regards to the Armenian-Azerbaijani conflict and the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, the, the evolution uh, of the Russian position, uh, how the Russian commentariat viewed the conflict and how the Russian politicians viewed the conflict and tried to convey it. Uh, through the journalism and uh, through journalism and through the articles and and interviews and so on and so forth. The other uh, uh, aspect that were interesting for me was Russian view of the American and European involvement in the regional affairs and to what degree uh, they were apprehensive of these developments. So I uh, have chosen three articles. <clears throat> um, uh, that I would like to show in a slide that will give the readers some idea of what I mean here. Let me pull this up. And... Can you see this? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay, so this is uh, the, the first that I chose was mm. the evolution of Turkey's position. This is an interview published in Izvestia, one of the uh, flagship Soviet uh, era newspapers, published in Izvestia in 1991. Uh, right after Turkey recognizes Azerbaijan's independence and right before the collapse of the Soviet uh, Empire in, uh, in 1991. The interview of Izvestia is with the Turkish ambassador to the USSR, Volkan Vural. I think he's still around and I think he's, uh, he's a high-ranking Turkish diplomat still. And... Uh, just to give the readers an idea about the uh, evolution of, of the Turkish position, uh, uh, I will read uh, uh, these parts that I have highlighted. Uh, how in 1991, Turkey was uh, firmly in, uh, in, in the Western fold or in the NATO fold, and it was, it was not uh, throwing its weight around, and it was beholden to... Uh, the not to the diktat, but to the suggestions of the U.S. State Department and the White House, uh, and how calm and measured uh, the Turkish response to the uh, developments in Nagorno-Karabakh were. So the question from the Izvestia journalist is, but doesn't the announcement add uh, fuel to the fire of the continuing war in Nagorno-Karabakh, the announcement of Azerbaijan's independence and Turkish recognition? The answer of the ambassador is no, not at all. In recognizing the sovereignty of the neighboring republic, we simultaneously affirm our non-interference in the internal and foreign affairs of any independent state. Furthermore, we intend to continue to cooperate with Ukraine, Armenia, Moldova, and Georgia as well. And so if, for example, Armenia were to take a similar request of Turkey tomorrow, would your government grant that request? That is correct that no other republic beside Azerbaijan has made such a request of us is another matter. Since we have mentioned Armenia, Izvestis readers will find it un not uninteresting to learn that Turkey plans to open a consulate in, in Yerevan. This is in 1991. Uh, as, as I was saying, Turkey was more or less uh, predictable and it was a rational and a responsible actor in, in, in the newly emerging dynamics in the region. But then it becomes even more interesting. Uh, having the hindsight of the 2020 war and today's position uh, of Turkey. Uh, the, uh, the other question is, all right then, so Turkey regards Azerbaijan as an independent state. What if, after a certain period of time, Baku suddenly asks you to sell weapons to it? The answer of the ambassador is, naturally, we will not be able to grant such a request for the simple reason that Ankara knows full well just where such weapons would be sent. And in general, my country strives to promote the resolution of any conflicts solely by peaceful means. This is our firm position, 
Furthermore, a decision was recently adopted to reduce the strength of the Turkish armed forces by 50 percent. I mean, just looking uh, that in 1991, Turkey was making this pronouncement and Turkey was, uh, uh, you know, it's it's politicians. Sure, and they're politicians and its diplomats are sure diplomats and, and they have ways of speaking. But at the same time, it, it sort of speaks to the to to that rationality that seems to be to have gone out the window since the days of Erdogan. But it gets even more interesting. Another article that you know you can trace the evolution of the Turkish position and the hardening of the lines, not just with 1993, but closer we get to our own timeline is uh, another article uh, uh, about this is uh, after the debacle of the Swiss protocols and so on and so forth. This is in 2012, an article published by Yuri Rox uh, in the Nizavisimaya Gazeta, one of the most influential Russian newspapers that is in name at least independent, but uh, its editors nowadays are pretty much beholden to the Kremlin. But in 19, in 2012, Yuri Roks, who has been uh, 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 who is a very knowledgeable journalist of the Caucasus and, and has been uh, in, you know, in Armenia and in Azerbaijan and Nagorno Karabakh for a number of times, publishes this very interesting article that I've highlighted that interesting part that shows again uh, the reluctance of Turkey to get involved militarily. Uh, on the side of Azerbaijan. Although it had Azerbaijan's back diplomatically, it was still reluctant and it was, in a sense, still preaching peace or peaceful resolution to the conflict. And the part is, uh, he's talking, uh, Yuri Rox is talking to sources uh, in the Kremlin, I believe, who tell him that even though it is not abandoning the principle of Azerbaijan's territorial integrity, Ankara is categorically against the use of force scenario in tackling the issue. So much so that according to unconfirmed but very persistent rumors after the 2008 Russian-Georgian war, Turkish Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan advised Azerbaijani President Ilham Aliyev in a friendly way, quote, forget about recovering Nagorno-Karabakh through war, unquote. The interlocutor also said, that in light of this, Turkey is concerned by the fact that Azerbaijan is purchasing large amounts of arms from Israel, as well as by its excessive activity on the Iranian front. Again, we see the Turkish position has sort of evolved, but at the same time, Turkey is uh, uh, reluctant to support Azerbaijan's military adventure. All of this would undergo uh, tremendous and seismic changes in the wake of the war in Syria, which would alter uh, Ankara's uh, calculus. And with the Russian military involvement on the side of Assad, uh, Ankara begins to think other thoughts regarding how these issues could be solved. And in 2015, the position is changing. Azerbaijan is more emboldened. And where we have the 2016 uh, uh, the, or the war in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, where Turkey had already began to show its teeth uh, re uh, towards Armenia and making, in no uncertain terms, certain demands uh, towards Armenia regarding the conflict and regarding how the conflict should be used. So these articles give an interesting sort of view of the evolution uh, of of the Turkish position, uh, but uh, <clears throat> this evolution also happens with the with the uh, Russian position. As I said in the introduction, that Russia has at times favored Yerevan and at times has favored uh, Baku, but at all times this favored Moscow. It is in a sense uh, a true truism, uh, and and it is expected, and 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 it should not be surprised. But as close as we get to our timeline, uh, the Russian position, especially since the so-called revolution where uh, uh, where uh, Nikol Pashinyan comes to power, the Russian position uh, through journalists and through think tank uh, 
uh, and through TV programs become more and more uh, clear cut and more and more uh, categorical of Armenia and a representative article, I think, uh, that speaks to the changing dynamics and where you could sense that trouble was in the air for Armenia and and, and the, the, the relationship with Russia was uh, beginning to fray under Pashinyan and his increasingly erratic uh, foreign policy uh, behavior and uh, increasing belligerence and so on and so forth. Uh, 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 in 2018, this is right after Pashinyan has come to power, uh, <clears throat> uh, Alexander Khramchikhin, who is a very well-known Russian analyst uh, with, uh, with strong uh, ties uh, to the Kremlin establishment, uh, or, or with strong sources in the Kremlin and the Ministry of Defense, uh, wrote this article in Nizavisima Gazeta, uh, that already was uh, sort of threatening, and you could read it as sort of a blackmail. Uh, sure, Khramchikhin is not a policymaker, he's just a journalist, but at the same time, uh, he knows what he's talking about, and these articles of this sort, at least, do not happen in a vacuum, and they have a backstory, and so on and so forth. And the title of the article is, Pun is the Russian military base in Gyumri Moor. Uh, and I'll just read some of these passages, and, and the tonality of the article is just uh, uh, tremendous in the sense that it, 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 it is impolitic in a sense, and uh, very boorish, if you will. And, but it also was uh, sir, uh, sort of an omen and a harbinger of things to come. Uh, first, he talks about the significance of the 102nd military base in Gyumri. Uh, he talks about that it, it is uh, there not to solve uh, military problems because it's outmatched against the main adversary in that direction. Uh, the Turkish army is much more stronger in, in that direction than Russia is. And so the base is there for political purposes. And, and and he elaborates on it. Uh, but he also starts talking in, 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 in very categorical terms. He says, thus, the 102nd military base is a guarantor of Armenia's existence. In other words, for Russia, the base in Armenia is a matter of geopolitical ambition, while for Armenia, it is a matter of survival. The Armenian authorities understand this, at least all the previous authorities have, it is not so clear if the new authorities do. So they not only allow Russia to use the base free of charge, but they pay for it, uh, for being there. This might be the only such case in the world, and probably it is. Uh, Armenia is uh, nearly totally maintaining the Russian base in Gyumri. I think about 85 or 90 percent of all the expenditure of the Russian base comes from Armenia's uh, budget, rather than from Russia. However, uh, continuing uh, uh, with the article. However, the attitude in the Armenian society towards the presence of Russian troops is highly ambiguous. Anti-Russian sentiment is being very actively fanned both inside and outside the country. Our author completely forgets uh, that part when Russian soldier uh, massacred an entire family and much of the anti-Russian uh, sentiment was based on, the, on, on, on how that case was handled. And then he continues, therefore, it is difficult to say what the long-term prospects are for the 102nd military base's continued presence in Armenia. Although its departure would be suicide for Armenia, the world, unfortunately, has known more than enough examples of suicides of entire societies. You can see this, uh, this uh, extra and 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 the boorishness in the article. But at the same time, uh, we have to appreciate that these sentiments are very real, and these sentiments are are held and discussed and and uh, litigated in the Russian press and the uh, and the Russian political elite. Further, he continues, Moscow is pretending that the irreconcilable conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan generally does not concern it, so it has no problem supplying arms to both sides, even though Armenia is a member of the CSTU and Azerbaijan is not. 
And the last two paragraphs uh, are the coup de gras, if you will. However, the Armenians ultimately should only be offended at themselves. They were fully aware of their actions when they took, le took a leading role in the process of dismantling the USSR. They're already blaming the Arme Armenians, you know, brought down the USSR. So we have to hold it against them uh, uh, about, you know, how Russia is choosing to, uh, uh, to put its fingers uh, on, on the weight. Armenia behaved in a more civilized and decent manner than many other former Soviet republics, but it did make a break for independence extremely actively and confidently. Its citizens should have been fully aware of the very complicated, mildly speaking, geopolitical situation Armenia might end up in after gaining independence. And that is exactly the situation it did end up in. There was no other possible outcome. Today, Moscow and Yerevan are in completely different geopolitical weight classes and consequently addressing issues on completely different levels. Therefore, cognizant and grown-up Armenians must take a sober look at things and understand who needs the 102nd military base more. So this is uh, uh, the, the, the talking down, the chiding, treating the Armenian uh, political elites uh, as, as infantile, which uh, <clears throat> in many cases uh, they are, but at the same time coming from an ally, coming from a formal ally, this sort of language and this sort of sentiments uh, are, are, are not something that are salutary and, and, and commendable, if you will. So this is sort of the, the evolution of the, of the Russian position, which, uh, uh, the, uh, which is, and, and just on the example of the Russian and Turkish positions, uh, it becomes uh, in, uh, interesting uh, uh, and 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 it's to be immensely studied, and I'm glad I was able to pull these articles and have them translated and 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 contribute and edit and so on and so forth and present. So uh, uh, to, to conclude, uh, the uh, the book has uh, is essentially. Um, uh, uh, composed of these types of articles. Uh, in a sense, they uh, will allow the readers, the specialists, the historians, the policy analysts to have a background uh, in, in a way that has been inaccessible for years or has been analyzed and has been mediated rather than immediate. This uh, this way, uh, bringing these articles to readers, I have try to get rid of the middlemen and I have tried to, to not be a middleman myself and just allow the readers to delve into these articles and be able to reconstruct almost uh, how the art how the how the conflict was happening how it was emerging and how it was uh, evolving and how the dynamics were changing so on and so forth um and I think I'll stop there, and uh, we can we can uh, go to uh, the Q and A's, and I'm sure some people will have uh, questions to ask about what is happening currently. Very good. Thank you so much, Artyom, for your uh, thoughtful and incisive um, presentation. I believe we can now go to uh, some of the many questions that we have um, received online. Uh, Sebu, would you like to go first? Uh, you can ask a question of your own or one of the questions that are in the sure. queue. Yeah. Go right ahead. Sure, I'll ask her, I'll, I'll pick off the discussion or the question period by a question uh, relating the, to the book in particular. So thank you very much, Artyom, for that wonderful talk. Uh, I really like your analogy of the Sherpa leading us through the mountainous terrain of the politics and history of that region. Uh, the question I have for you has to do with the Sherpa's ability to guide us through that mountainous terrain before 1988 and Perestroika and Glasnost when the most recent phase of the conflict uh, got underway. So um, I've noticed over the last few years that uh, um, 
much of the discussion, almost all of the discussion is focused on post 90s, post 80s uh, dim- dimension of the conflict. And yet, as a historian, I'm very well aware that the conflict did not emerge out of thin air and that one doesn't need to go back centuries. One only needs to go back to the Soviet period to understand some of the roots, some of the uh, some of the, the issues that uh, stimulated conflict and hatred in that region. And so on that note, my question to you is, I'm wondering um, uh, why uh, you decided, if you if that is in fact the case, not to include any documents from the Russian press for the period of the 60s or 50s and 40s, but particularly 60s, when um, the the population of the region felt uh, extreme levels of persecution or uh, um, unfair treatment in as as a part as an integral part of Azerbaijan in terms of Azeri nationality policy and so on. We all know that the first inklings or signs of the conflict began in 64, when about uh, when the region's leaders basically wrote an appeal to uh, Khrushchev at that period. So I'm wondering if you could comment on that and maybe shed some light on the, uh, the dynamics of the situation in the 50s, 60s, and give us some example examples of uh, built-in uh, discrimination that um, resulted from Azeri uh, nationality policy in that region, in that period. Uh, thank you, Sebu, for the thoughtful uh, uh, question. Uh, the biggest reason I didn't go as far was because this, in the Soviet press, as you may imagine, as you may know, these issues were not up for discussion. A lot of this stuff that was happening was not published in the press. A lot of the tensions that were happening were not being published in the press. Or if they were, uh, they may had one or two paragraphs, very uh, lacking substantive uh, information as, as to what was happening. And the Soviet press uh, in the 60s and 70s utterly censored, of course. And a lot of the nationality policies and so on and so forth, the Druzhba Narodov, which is the, the fraternity of the brother, the brotherhood of the nations, and so on and so forth, were uh, sort of covered in the press in a very bombastic way. Everything was fine, everything was beautiful, and there was this uh, brotherhood and class solidarity, and we're building a new world where none of this matters, anyways. Why should we concentrate on it? So, as hard as I tried, and I did hard, and I did try hard. To find sources, there were the most of the stuff that you would find from the region, like from the Nagorno Karabakh and so on and so forth, were uh, published mostly not in political newspapers, but in journals and mag- magazines rather that were popular, and they were touting the region's beauty. The Armenians in Nagorno Karabakh were called the Methuselahs, the long-living people who lived 110, 120 years old. And they seem to never taste uh, death, and and uh, a lot of that had to do with 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 solitary aspects of Armenian Azerbaijani coexistence, and how these, you know, the differences that were uh, between the Armenians and Azeris, and the conflict conflicts that happened were rudiments from the Tsarist era, and the Soviets came, and the conflict no longer exists, and so on and so forth. So. The biggest reason was that it was just nearly impossible to find any discussion of these tensions in, in the press. Now, if you went to the regional uh, Armenian and, uh, and and Azerbaijani press, you would probably find some reporting. But again, it would be very muted and very um, uh, very apprehensive as to... Uh, to the coverage, not to in order not to inflame the existing social dynamics and the existing uh, social relation between these two nations. But when the conflict was starting to happen in 1988, a lot of this apprehensiveness on the part of the journalists was gone. This was the era of perestroika and glasnost. So you could write about these issues, and you could write about these issues um, in a way that would 
uh, provide knowledge to the readers. And you have, we, I mean, you have to understand that the readership in the Soviet Union in the 1980s was also beginning to change. And their, uh, their encounters with the reality of the Soviet system and, 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 and the rottenness of the system in many ways was beginning to dawn on them. So they had, uh, there was much more coverage and the uh, sources were much more accessible in that way. So that is probably the biggest reason. And also because the conflict uh, sort of catapulted itself in 1988, and it was such a shock to the Soviet system as well, that uh, everybody and their grandmother wanted to write an article and wanted to understand what was happening. All of a sudden, a region that 99% of the Soviet population had not heard of a region that was not known for anything spectacular, for, for anything in particular, uh, in their mind, in the cognitive map of the Soviet citizens, all of a sudden there is bloodshed, uh, there is murder, and so on and so forth. And just to give you an idea about the lack of understanding, just a personal anecdote, my father-in-law from Ukraine, uh, when we first met, he confessed to me, saying, basically, I thought, uh, you know, the Abkhazians lived in Abkhazia, the Ossetians lived in Ossetia, Armenians lived in Armenia, and Karabakhtis, he thought it was a separate nationality or an ethnic group. Karabakhtis lived in Karabakh. He had no idea that the Karabakh people were Armenians. So just a personal anecdote about the lack of education or the lack of, or or the ignorance of the your average Soviet citizen in the region and and the disinterest in the region. So in 1980s it all began to change with the uh, with the emergence of the Karabakh movement and and so on and so forth. Right. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> at least a couple of our questions, Artem, pertain to the reliance of the U.S. press on certain scholars uh, regarding uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, in fact, those of us in Los Angeles just this morning, if we read the Los Angeles Times, may have seen an article about Secretary of State Blinken's contacting uh, President Aliyev of Azerbaijan, urging him to um, have to work toward the immediate uh, reopening of the um, Lotsen Corridor. And in this article, interestingly, the reporter repeatedly refers to a call to um, open a disputed corridor to Armenia. The term disputed is used so often. And so uh, I wonder if you have a comment on that, A, and B, who are the scholars on whom the U.S. press should be relying, in your opinion, um, for more detailed information on this? Well, the second question is easier. Me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thank you. No, I mean, I'm one of the few people that, I mean, uh, if I don't beat my drum, who will? Um so I'm probably one of the very few people who has done a dissertation on this topic, right? So, and I've been tracking and studying the, the conflict. But there is this also uh, 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 sort of orientalist uh, take that has persisted uh, far too long that anyone from the region is going to be biased and we rather find somebody whose last name doesn't end with an IAN or a YAN, whose last name doesn't end with Zade or Oglu or so on and so forth. So let's find somebody who is above the fray, who has God's eye view of the conflict, and they are this ephemeral floating spirits who look at the conflict from above and are able to draw conclusions that are more or less objective, more objective uh, than the people from the region and so on and so forth. It's a flawed understanding. Uh, it is a very uh, uh, detrimental. Uh, I, I'd rather have uh, people to push their propaganda uh, but and, and do it sincerely rather than have somebody who 
uh, who feigns neutrality, but at the same time has the sophisticated uh, linguistic arsenal to portray the conflict uh, uh, in, in a way that is detrimental to either side. Uh, I'd rather have somebody say, you know, come out and make their arguments sincerely and make their arguments that are not palatable to people uh, rather than somebody who feigns neutrality. Okay, uh, and and the U.S. journalists and the Western journalists, I mean, the Russian journalists are not uh, are also guilty of this, but to a lesser degree, uh, because the Russian journalists actually travel to the region. They're not gathering their data through Wikipedia articles and phone calls and Zoom calls and so on and so forth. The Russians, it's close. They travel and the travel is unrestricted and so on and so forth. Uh, so that dynamic exists. That dynamic has persisted for far too long. And, you know, during the conflict, every time I would get a phone call or a request for a media appearance, I was being pigeonholed as the Armenian expert, and I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to get involved in it. I'm, you know, I'm Armenian, but I live in America. I'm a product completely of the American higher education system. I have, you know, I have done scholarship that I tried as best as I can to be objective, and I've published in very good journals and in very book uh, publishing houses and so on and so forth. So I try my best to be this objective scholar. And even when I was saying about how I compiled the book, my book, my last name is going to, you know, uh, create problems for some people. And so that's why I decided, say, okay, I'm just going to give this inventory, give this articles, not written by an Armenian, and I'm not inserting my own analysis. Hear what they were saying, read it and understand it. Uh, so that that is sort of what's happening. It's very unfortunate. It's... Um, it 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 reminds me of you know, and this would be scandalous if it was the case. If 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 a Jewish person is asked to comment on in, on Israeli uh, Palestinian conflict and is ipso facto or a priori thrown aside as a conflict com, uh, part of the conflict, or his view should be dismissed uh, because it ends you know, uh, or, or because that person's background is Jewish or Arab, for that matter. So. It's it's in a sense it's it's ridiculous, um, but I don't see it changing anytime soon. Unfortunately, uh, I think it's going to. Uh, and and if if you follow the social media, the people that have no Armenian ancestry and if they uh, they tweet or write Facebook entries about it, they become much more sort of tweeted and retweeted by the conflicting parties, the interested parties than when somebody with an IAN or an Oglu tweets about this, unless there are boats that are trying to promote their views and so on and so forth. I, I hope it made sense what I was trying to Yeah, no, thank you very much. So I'll ask the next question on behalf of one of our uh, listeners. And our listener asks, how fluent, if at all, was the Russian media in the local languages of Yerevan and Baku? Or did they rely only on Russian? Oh, a couple of things. A couple of things. Like, uh, like I was saying, most of these medias had presence on the ground. So they had bureaus, if you will, uh, journalists that covered there or journalists that uh, oftentimes traveled there. But at the same time, they also used local full-time journalists who were fluent in the language went in the cultural idiom and so on and so forth. And the other thing also needs to be kept in mind that the lingua franca uh, until very recently was the Russian language. Uh, I mean, if you're Russian and you traveled uh, throughout the Soviet Caucasus or even the Caucasus right now, you will not starve to death. Uh, people can talk Russian. People will be more than glad to talk in Russian and so on and so forth. So linguistically, the challenge is less uh, restricting than if you were a foreigner. Yes, people in Armenia and Azerbaijan, some people speak English and French and German and so on and so forth, but not to the degree and not, uh, not to the amount of people that speak Russian. And so the Russian journalists had much more access. Uh, it was easier for them. It was cheaper for them to travel. 
And, and, and since uh, the conflict was happening inside the Soviet Union, at least until 1991, there was enormous interest uh, among the Soviet reading public uh, about the, what was happening. So it was, it was not, the, the difficulty was not um, uh, super uh, important in that sense. Okay. And yeah. would you like to? Yeah, I can um, pose another question um, from one of our viewers. So, uh, this this questioner asks about um, Russian the Russian media, especially now, being influenced by uh, potential bribery on the part of Azeri's connection that the leadership of Azerbaijan has with. Uh, the media in Russia, the leadership of Russia. Could you comment on, on that with respect to the uh, current situation? Yeah, I mean, the issue is not one-sided. If a journalist is willing to be bribed, he's willing to be bribed by anyone, by an Armenian, Azeri, or a Lithuanian. It doesn't matter, right? Money is money, and, uh, you know, money is convertible. And, and usable by anyone. So, but having said that, uh, in in the compilation process of the book, uh, when you're familiar with the region and you're familiar with the opinion makers and so on and so forth, I tried on my part uh, to weed out, and I think I uh, did it with some success. Anyone that I thought that was uh, that had written the article, uh, not under duress, but uh, if there were. I mean, you knew your paid shills who would write opinion pieces and so on and so forth. So I know the region. I know more or less uh, people who are interested in covering. And, and I know some of these Russian journalists, not not personally, but through their work. And, and, and they're more or less reliable and so on and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> having said that, the, uh, the, uh, the Azeris, of course, have... Uh, 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 tremendous uh, uh, the Azeri government and its paid propagandists and so on, their, their resources appear to be at least bottomless. And they tried through fair means or foul to change the narrative, uh, to, uh, to influence the narrative, not just in the Russian press, but in the, in the Western press as well through, uh, you know, paid uh, paid gigs and so on and so forth, hiring think tank people and so on and so forth. They're completely and systematically involved in this, uh, unlike the Armenian side, which uh, sometimes appears to be desultory and haphazard and driven mostly uh, 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 by by sheer patriotism rather than uh, Rather than financial incentives and so on and so forth, maybe I, I may I think Armenians may sh may want to change their approach to these issues if they want to have any uh, systematic way of tackling these issues that present themselves. And yes, in in the Russian media, uh, they have been successful uh, uh, to uh, to insert uh, figures of influence, recognizable figures. Uh, who could uh, either undermine the Armenian narrative or push their own narrative or their counter narrative. Um, but um, yeah, it, it's the Russian media, the problem I see today is not that even. The, the Russian media's problem right now I see is that their efforts and their resources are now fully concentrated uncovering the conflict in, in Ukraine, the war in Ukraine, which is awful, awful, awful. And and so the the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh is in the back burner, and they don't have their A-listers, in a way, covering the conflict. So the quality has gone down. Uh, the, the amount of the coverage has gone down. So there is a tremendous lack of, uh, 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 there is a tremendous vacuum uh, that uh, uh, and tremendous void in what kind of information is brought uh, to the Russian public, who, let's be honest, right now uh, are not that interested in the region. Thank you. A, thank you, Artem. I have a follow-up question uh, by one of the listeners, and uh, it deals with uh, the question of uh, 
alternative sources on the background of the conflict in the region, and particularly if there are any reputable uh, Azeri scholars, in your opinion, who have written on the conflict in a way that is not straightforwardly uh, impartial, uh, straightforwardly biased. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a very difficult question. I, I will have to wreck my brand about, brain about it. <laughs> it, it's very difficult. I mean, um, ninety-nine percent of the stuff you encounter written by Azerbaijani scholars from Azerbaijan is going to be just bombast and propaganda. Uh, and uh, in Azerbaijan, independent scholarship is uh, pretty much uh, uh, is. Uh, is non-existent. Those that try to do independent scholarship uh, have pretty much are in exile. A couple of scholars that uh, have written knowledgeably are is Bayram Balchi, who's uh, I think he has written in, in uh, and Raul Motika. I don't know if Raul is even Azerbaijani, but Bayram Balchi is the only person that I think that has written. But he writes about it tangentially. He's not interested in the conflict per se. Is more or less interested in in the uh, in, in political Islam in Azerbaijan, and and Nagorno Karabakh makes uh, on his radar, um, which is not to say that uh, there isn't uh, valuable scholarship coming out of there. It's just that far in between, and you will have a hard time finding. It. Maybe in the Russian scholarly magazines, but even even there. It's it's very hard and very disheartening when you look at it, uh, the way the scholarship is conducted. I, oftentimes I put on my social media account uh, some of the stuff that Azerbaijani scholars write with regards to Armenia and so on and so forth. Recently, two professors from the State Oil Academy of Azerbaijan or State Oil University of Azerbaijan, one of their best universities, wrote an article uh, and, and they they call the Armenians uh, small people with unstable moral values. I mean, it's in a in 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 a philosophical journal published by the Academy of Sciences of Azerbaijan. Uh, like you know, libelous and scandalous stuff like that. I I, I can share. Uh, uh, I have tremendous amount of this stuff that I have collected. Which is not not to say that these people don't exist. Uh, they exist, but. Uh, it's very, very hard um, to have uh, a conversation. I mean, also we have to say that you know a lot. There is a lot of Armenian nationalist uh, his, historians uh, who also are engaged in this gump, in this struggle, and they look at historical uh, production not as as a science in itself, but it has a tele teleological uh, angle to it. Everything that there there is being written is written with a certain purpose, not to produce knowledge for knowledge's sake, but to produce knowledge that justifies Armenian existence or justifies Armenia's claims, and so on and so forth. So this is, you know, a, you know, uh, it, it's it's a endless problem. But if you if I were to put them on the scales. Uh, Azerbaijani scholars are much more guilty in, in producing this kind of stuff than Armenians have ever been. Okay, thank you. So I think we have time just for one more question, which I'll pose. Um, Artem, you gave a very interesting overview of the evolution in the Russian press regarding Turkey's position uh, and its relationship with Azerbaijan as well as Armenia from 1991, when they appeared to um, respond positively to the declarations of independence and uh, indicated that there would be, um, you know, no sale of weapons to Baku and so forth. And yet in 1993, Turkey closed the border with Armenia. Would you care to comment on that event in light of this evolution with respect to the attitude toward um, Nagorno-Karabakh and Azerbaijan? Yeah, 1992 and 1993 were pivotal in that regard. 
Azerbaijan, you know, 1992, they lost Shushi, right? And in 1993, they lost Kelbajar. And Kelbajar was probably the turning pivotal event, or as Armenians call it, Karvajar. When Kelbajar was taken and the Armenians were making tremendous gains on the battlefield and Azerbaijanis were on the losing side. That is where, this is where the Turkish media and the Turkish policymakers become an important part of the story is that they start ginning up this angle that our Turkic brothers are losing and we are the second largest army in NATO and yet we are sitting aside and and we're being, you know, diplomatic about this when we can actually put our foot on the gas pedal ourselves and, and alter the situation and so on and so forth. But uh, this was also a period when Russia was categorically against uh, the Turkish involvement in Caucasus affairs, unlike today, with, which Russia is, seems to be just fine with Turkish inroads into the Caucasus, in Georgia and Azerbaijan and so on and so forth. So the Russians in no uh, uncertain terms let Turkey know that you cannot play the spoiler in this. Uh, we will not let this happen. And General Shapashnikov, Shapashnikov rather, uh, who in 1993 threatened uh, Turkey with consequences should Turkey, you know, uh, uh, enter Armenia or even think about entering Armenia. And there were actually there is press reports in the book that talks about that, uh, how Turkey had trained its tanks uh, against the Russian army base in Gumri and, and, and the Russians of course, we're aware and they had the intelligence and the uh, and, and so on and so forth. So they came pretty close, but Russia was much more categorical than it is now in, in, in this circumstance. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. This is a very insightful um, overview and, uh, you know, very clear documentation of this role. So thank you so much, Artyom, for thank you, really stimulating thank presentation. You, Yes. Uh, sorry. Did no, I was just saying, I was just adding <coughs> in to thanks, Artyom, as well. Uh, okay. I know we're concluding, so. Very good. All right. Well, um, this now brings us to the end of our webinar. Special thanks once again to Dr. Artyom Tanoyan for his stimulating presentation and discussion. Thanks as well to uh, Professor Seb Aslanian for coordinating this really excellent event. And now let me close by noting that the Promised Armenian Institute and its sister organizations have a number of events uh, planned in the near future, the very near future, actually. Uh, a late breaking event scheduled by our Promise Institute for Human Rights at UCLA Law um, pertains to the blocking of the Lifeline Road into Nagorno-Karabakh, Artsakh. This Zoom-based discussion is scheduled for this coming Thursday, January 26, 2023 at 12.15 p.m. Pacific time and involves a conversation about the ongoing situation on the ground in this region and the relevant international legal framework. So please consult our Promise Armenian Institute website for information on how to register for this Zoom only event. Let me also mention that on Saturday, February 18 and Saturday, February 25 at 10 a.m. Pacific, the 20th annual UCLA Graduate Student Colloquium in Armenian Studies will take place. This will also be uh, via Zoom. And then on Monday, February 27 at 10 a.m. Pacific, the Armenian Genocide Research Program within the Promise Armenian Institute will hold a Zoom-based webinar entitled The Hamidian Massacres of 1894 to 1897, Challenging Traditional Perspectives by Jel uh, Verhege with a discussant commentary by Dr. Owen Miller. There will be many other events planned. They are being planned for the coming months. So please be sure to visit our UCLA Promise Armenian Institute website or visit us on social media to see more details on our programming. Before closing, I'd like to offer our gratitude to our wonderful Promise Armenian Institute Deputy Director, 
Hasmik Bagdasarian and our assistant, Emily Polosian, who have been working behind the scenes in coordinating uh, this event. So thank you once again to all of you for your attendance at this webinar. And we look forward to having you participate in future events for the Promise Armenian Institute at UCLA.